G'day, welcome to our new unit that is looking at the group 17 halogens. In today's lesson, we're going to describe and understand the trends observed in the physical and chemical properties of the group 17 halogens. The learning outcomes are addressed them from the Cambridge curriculum just below there. So moving on from the unit we just finished, which was looking at the group two metals, the alkaline earth metals. We're now looking at the other end of the periodic table, looking at uh, the non-metals, in particular the group 17, also slash group seven, they're also called, uh, known as the halogens, which are over here. So they're called group 17 because they're in group 17 or with the Roman numerals, you can designate a seven if you're ignoring your transition metals, uh, your D block in the middle there. Known as the halogens, this is a term where the hal part comes from sort of uh, Greek meaning salt and the gen is in the genesis, as in they can produce salts because that's what they do when they react with a the metal, they form ionic salts. So that's where the term halogen comes from, salt producing. Group seven, they're gonna have that seven valence electrons and like we looked at with the group two, valence electrons are the ones that are dictating the chemical reactivity and the type of chemical reactions that they undergo. So similarly to what we saw in the previous unit, we're going to see some trends in the chemical properties, also in the physical properties as we go down the group. They're in the P block. So we've got the S block one and two, we've got the D block in the center there, F block down there, these are in our P block. And if we were to do the electron config of a number of these, we would see they all end with um, P5. For example, fluorine, number nine, it's gonna be one S2, two S2, 2p5, 2 plus 2 plus 5 is 9. If we've got chlorine just underneath it, chlorine at number 17, it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. 10 plus 7 is chlorine. So they're finishing with these five valence p orbital electrons. Seven in the total principal quantum level, because the principal quantum level is going to be, you know, 2 plus 5, 7. 2 plus 5, 7, but the outermost orbital is that p orbital. They have chemical properties, largely depend on the valence electrons, so we'll observe similar chemical, similar chemical properties going down the group. But to begin with, like we did with the group twos, we are going to focus first on the physical properties. Let's look here. We have the halogen atomic number. So we got fluorine, chlorine, uh, bromine, and then iodine and we're looking at the atomic radius, we can see a pretty clear increase, general increase in the atomic radii as we go down the group. They are all non-metals, our halogens, and they exist as diatomic molecules at room temperature. So if we have the elements at room temperature, fluorine can form one electron, we're gonna form one covalent bond, we make a diatomic. Di meaning two, atomic meaning atom, two atom molecules. Same with chlorine, going to be Cl2, diatomic chlorine. This is how they're found at room temperature due to that single covalent bond that they're going to form. So let's have a look. Why do we have an increase in the atomic radii? Have a think. Now I'm going to tell you. It's because we're going down the group. As we go down the group, we're adding a principal quantum level each time. So that's going to make the atom a larger atom. If we think about this, if we have our fluorine has two principal quantum levels, one, two. Chlorine's gonna have three principal quantum levels, levels one, two, three. It's obviously going to be a larger atomic radii. Underneath that, bromine's gonna have four, so on and so forth. So pretty straightforward for that first one. More principal quantum levels as we go down the group. All right, let's extrapolate that a little bit further and look at melting points and boiling points. I want you to have a pause and have a think and see if you can come up with what you think and why you think where the trend uh, that would be observed as you go down the group in terms of the melting and boiling points. Consider that, and what we see is this melting point and the boiling point. So we can see in both these cases, we have a general increase in the um, melting and boiling points. Now we can rationalize this based on their intermolecular forces. So when we talk about covalent molecules, Covalent bonds are very strong, however, the bonds between the molecules, the intermolecular forces, are generally much weaker. Now, in both of, in all of our cases of our halogens, we are going to have nonpolar molecules. If it's bonded to itself, there's no difference in electronegativity. There's no difference in the electronegativity 
well then it's not going to distribute that electron differently because they're identically the same atom. They're both fluorines, they're both chlorines, etc., etc. So nonpolar molecules, nonpolar molecules have weak Van der Waals forces, where Van der Waals are those instantaneous, those temporary um, dipoles that appear, and then they can cause a sort of chain reaction with the delta positive at one end, causing a Van der Waal, a temporary dipole on the next molecule, so on and so forth. These forces are proportional to the number of electrons. As you have more electrons, there's a higher chance and there's a higher occurrence of the temporary dipoles arising. More electrons, there's sort of more fluctuations. Therefore, the more electrons that we have, the more Van der Waals interactions we have. The more Van der Waal interactions we have, the more force of attraction between our diatomic nonpolar molecules. So larger halogen molecules therefore have stronger forces moving down the group. So fluorine is the most volatile and iodine is the least volatile. Now one thing that is interesting about the, um, about the halogens is if we look at our sort of our room temperature, which is, you know, say about 20, 25, 30 degrees, uh, 20 to 30 degrees for like, uh, you know, our average room temperatures, we can see that some are going to exist as gas, some are going to exist as liquids, and some are going to exist as solids at room temperature. So they all exist in different phases, as illustrated here. Chlorine gas, bromine liquid, and then that's the iodine solid, acetine also being a solid beneath iodine there. Now bromine is an interesting one, it's one of only two elements, the other being mercury, that is actually liquid at room temperature. Quite fascinating, and we can see they've all got pretty vastly different colors. They're getting darker as we go down the group. So we have this light greenish color for the chlorine, we have this red brownish vapor uh, and the liquid for the bromine, and then the purple vapor and the purple solid for the iodine. Righto, <clears throat> let's look at another property which is electronegativity. If we think back earlier on when we discussed electronegativity, we define that as the ability for an atom to attract a share paired of electrons. So if we have a covalent bond, the electron pair that's been shared, so the covalent bond essentially, isn't necessarily distributed evenly between the two atoms that are bonded. It can work out that one of the atoms can uh, attract the shared electron pair closer to itself, which will give it a partially positive or a partially negative charge. Partially negative charge if it's attracting it closer, partially positive if it's been attracted further away from it. Uh, the electrons that is. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. Now the electronegativity is all to do with how close to having a full valence shell they are. It's also to do with how many um, principal quantum levels, the inner shielding effect of the electrons, and also the nuclear charge. So there's a whole bunch of factors that will dictate um, how electronegative an atom will be. And it turns out that fluorine is the most electronegative because it has the perfect um, balance, I suppose, of all of these different uh, factors. So what we see is the electronegativity decreases down the group. So the ability for one of the halogens to attract the bonding pair of electrons to itself decreases as we go down from fluorine down to astatine. And we can rationalize this. Um, because we have an increase in the atomic radii that we discussed before with the physical properties. As we go down, we're adding principal quantum levels, therefore we have different uh, larger atomic radii. Um, so the shared electrons are nearer the positive nucleus for fluorine. So for our smaller atoms, the shared electrons, which are going to be the ones in the valence shell, are going to be much closer to the nucleus compared to the larger ones. This means that the smaller ones can hold that shared electron pair closer to itself, consequently meaning it's more electronegative. We also have less shielding from the inner shell electrons for smaller atoms. So even though you might consider, well, the ones further down the group do have a larger nuclear charge, and you're very correct that they do, it just turns out that the number of shells is a much uh, more prevalent effect on the electronegativity of our halogens. You beauty, moving forward. All right, let's look at the reactivity of our halogens now. Based on the trend observed in the electronegative, can you, uh, electronegativity, can you predict the trend in the reactivity moving down the group? So based on what we saw here, how do you predict the atom's reactivity will change as we go down the group? Pause now, give that a think. Hopefully you got an answer. Let's see if you were on the right track. We see a decrease. They get less reactive as we go down the group. 
Now we can rationalize this the same way that we rationalized why the electronegativity uh, is going to decrease down the group. It's all about how the, 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 the pull, the attraction that the blue ring will have on electrons. And particularly, blue ring will have the strongest pull on electrons, again due to those factors of atomic radii and inner, show, uh, inner shielding effects, uh, etc, etc. They're going to react the most vigorously because they have the strongest pull. Now, they're going to act as oxidizing agents. Let us consider this. If we have group seven, we've got seven valence electrons to fulfill the octet to have a stable electronic configuration, they're going to want to gain one electron. Uh, reduction is gain of electrons, therefore our group seven is gonna be reduced, which means that they will cause something else to be oxidized. Remember, redox has to happen with a reduction and an oxidation. Something that gains electrons through reductions, they have to have gained those electrons from somewhere, so they cause something else to be oxidized, to lose those electrons. So therefore, they are reduced, but they act as an oxidizing agent. They cause something else to be oxidized. Let's have a go at a question. Pause now, see if you can work through this one. Use the change in oxidation numbers of the reactions below to show the group 17 element is acting as an oxidizing agent. So we've got two equations, determine the oxidation numbers, and then show that the group 17, our halogen, is acting as an oxidizing agent, and check your answer. Now, so the first one, we have calcium, it's a solid, reacting with bromine as a liquid. Remember, bromine is one of the only liquids uh, that we have at room temperature. And we form calcium bromide as a solid, forming that ionic salt. Remember, the name of the halogens come from the fact that they're salt producing. So we have zero oxidation state over here, zero oxidation state over there. Now, over here, we have our calcium as a plus two, because that's the ion it's going to form. We have our bromine as a minus one. We want to show this acting as an oxidizing agent. So let's have a look at the bromine. If we're going from zero to minus one, we are getting more negative. If it's getting more negative, it's gaining electrons. Reduction is a gain of electrons. Therefore, this is going to be acting as an oxidizing agent. This is causing the calcium to be oxidized. It's an agent of the oxidation. We can see that zero to plus two, it's getting more positive, so it's losing electrons. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Then we have one with a couple of non-metals, where we got hydrogen gas plus chlorine gas forming hydrochloric acid, hydrogen chloride gas. And we can show the same thing down here. Both of these are gonna have zero as their original oxidation state. Over here, plus one, minus one. Let's look at our halogen. We're going from zero to minus one. Same thing, it is getting more negative, so it's gaining negative electrons. We have a reduction. Therefore, it's acting as the oxidizing agent. It's causing the hydrogen to be oxidized, and we can see that it is losing electrons because it's getting more positive, so it's losing negative electrons. Excellent. All right, let's talk about some more reactions. We can get these things called displacement reactions. Displacement reactions are just what they sound like, a reaction where one element will displace another, will replace it. Now, it's all dependent on their reactivity. And we now have discussed the trends in the reactivity of the halogens as we go down the group. So we can use this trend to predict if a displacement reaction will occur or not, because the more reactive uh, atom can displace a less reactive atom. So a less reactive halogen can be displaced by a more reactive halogen. Here's a question. Pause this and have a go at this one as well. If you added chlorine water, aqueous chlorine, to a solution of sodium bromide, would a reaction occur right in equation if so? So consider which is the less reactive halogen, which is the more reactive halogen. If we have the more reactive halogen, it will displace the less reactive. Will that reaction occur right in equation if you think it would? And we will check it now. That reaction would indeed, and we would get this reaction where we have chlorine is more electronegative so chlorine is more reactive um, because we know reactivity decreases going down the group. Bromine is lower than the chlorine. So if we add the more reactive thing, then it's going to displace that because that's going to want to be in that uh, reduced state more than the other thing will be. And that's exactly what we observe. So the chlorine is going to react with two bromides to form two chlorides and one bromine. Now you could also write this with the um, sodium spectator ions where you've got the sodium bromide and the sodium chloride, but we can just write it as an ionic equation which is a bit simpler. Now, if we had it the other way around, if we had bromine 
reacting with the chloride, in that case, we would see no reaction occur. So if I had, uh, let's say we had bromine water and we had a solution of sodium chloride, in this case, the bromine is less reactive than the chlorine. So the chloride is going to want to stay in the reduced form because it's more reactive. So this would see no reaction occurring because the more reactive element, the more reactive halogen uh, is already in the ionic salt. So it won't be replaced by the less reactive halogen. Now we can use this uh, to get information about an unknown um, substance if we have one because we have these very characteristic colors of our diatomic halogens that we saw earlier. So we can use these color changes and we'll look at this a lot more in the next lesson in a qualitative analysis to infer information if we have to identify an unknown substance, what's called a qualitative analysis. But for now, we can just note that if we're gonna have a color change, so for example, if we started with the chlorine, which is one color, and then we saw the bromine, which is another color, we saw that color change, we could infer information about what that original substance was. Now, these are difficult to see in solution, but we can dissolve them in an organic layer, and in an organic layer and an aqueous layer, they're gonna be immiscible liquids, so we have two different layers, and we can see the color changes uh, very clearly in the organic layer. So we can use something like cyclohexane and See the colors to deduce information. Moving on to some more reactions here. The formation of hydrogen halides. Halogens react with hydrogen gas to form hydrogen halides. Reactions decrease in vigorousness as we move down the group. Now this makes sense because we talked about the idea that the reactivity decreases going down the group. So if they're less reactive going down, we would expect that the reactions with the same thing, in this case the hydrogen, they would be less vigorous as we go down. So to compare two things, we have hydrogen and fluorine, very violent reaction, whereas something like hydrogen and iodine, uh, on heating will form an equilibrium. So going down to the iodine, we don't even have the reaction go to completion, it forms an equilibrium, compared to the fluorine, which is a explosive reaction. So we also see a trend therefore, based on this, in the thermal stability of the hydrogen halides, where it decreases going down the group. And we can rationalize this based on the bond energy. If we look here, if we have the atomic number of the halide in the hydrogen halide bond, so we start with HCl, then we have, oh, pardon me, we start with HF, then we have HCl, HBr, HI. We can see the bond energy gets weaker as we go down the group. So therefore, they're going to be less thermally stable um, as we go down the group as well. See a decrease in the strength of bond energy going down the group. And this is due to the atomic radii overlap the outer shell orbitals create much, uh, creates the bonds, but the atoms become much bigger going down the group, giving a longer bond length. So if the covalent bond is further away from the nucleus, which is what um, you know is electrostatically attracting, the positive nucleus attracts the negative bonded electrons. Further away that is, the less electrostatic force of attraction, therefore the weaker the bond is. So if we think about thermal stability, which is just what it sounds like, the stability that they have when they're heated, therefore going down, we have a weaker bond that will require less energy to break and therefore less thermally stable. We're gonna break that bond with heat. And that concludes our first, our first lesson into the group 17 halogens. What have we done? We described the colors and the trend in volatility of uh, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Interpret the volatility of the elements in terms of the van der Waals forces. We described the relative reactivity of elements as oxidizing agents. Describe and explain the reactions of the elements with hydrogens. Describe and explain the relative thermal stabilities of the hydrides. Interpret these relative stabilities in terms of the bond energies. Your task for this lessons, pause now, work through those to consolidate your understandings. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next one when we conclude our look at the group 17 halogens. Have a fabulous day.